What do I do in a situation where, let's just say I'm running a, um, a session and I'm kind of, I'm just not being able to handle the group and I'm making some errors along the way and then the boss decides to step in and takes over kind of pushes me out the way and says, I'll take over from now, Gerald. It, um, it seems like uh, you've had your turn and you're not doing a good job under his breath. What do I do then? So this is unfortunately a common situation. Mm. Um, uh, we had a client contact us this week with a situation exactly like that where um, they were going through a process, the facilitator, two facilitators with a group, uh, were taking people through a process that had an element of risk. So things were going to happen, things could get out of control. And a sensitive topic came up. A senior executive was in that room, so your hypothetical was actually real mm. in, in this scenario. Um, and the senior executive effectively stopped or suspended the session. Mm. Now, that becomes tricky because in, within an organisation, it's easy for you and I, we're probably not of the organisation, so we all have a different level of authority, but let's say that we were part of an L&D department mm. or some sort of training department, and someone senior in that organisation pulled rank. They had authority and they used it. There, there'll be a reason why they do that. And nine times out of ten, when I'm working with senior executives or even working in our own business, when I'm leading our team, if they don't see certainty they will try and create certainty. So if they don't have that faith in your scenario that you have control of the situation, their nature, because of their experience, they got where they are for a reason. They're going to want to take an element of control to regain certainty. Now, for us as professionals, the first thing we need to give that senior leader is some dignity. And we need to give them benefit of the doubt that they see something that we don't. Mm. But the balance in this situation is that as the facilitator of that group or that situation, you're the process expert. Mm. And if you're doing a good job and a professional job, you're managing that process of the group. So juggling someone taking over with, I'm going to give away that power to someone who has that authority is really tricky. I've, I've been in that situation myself. Now, this is probably easier for me to say because I've got a different view. When I've worked in organisations, I see people in their roles as people. I don't see them as their roles. I see them as someone in this role with this degree of accountability and they get mm. remunerated for that, but they're still a person. Mm. So in a situation where um, someone takes over on, on your gig, Gerald, mm. perhaps you could say to them, that's a really go good observation. We didn't see that. Guys, we're doing this process. Mm. Should we see if this process can resolve that issue mm. and you maintain that leadership position that you have with the group? But you need to respect and honour that senior person. Mm. If you make them wrong, mm. obviously if you're within an organisation, there's a political price you'll mm. pay for that. And if you're a consultant, mm. well, there's a financial price you'll pay for that. I've got a good one for you. Can I, can I jump in there? I've got a good one for you. Um, have you heard of Paul de Gelder? No. Paul de Gelder is the Navy SEAL diver who was attacked by a shark I think in Sydney okay so he's oh, um, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so he's done yeah. 60 minutes he's now on the speaking circuit so and he's a great speaker I love Paul I, I watch his Facebook page and it, it's it, it makes me laugh every time I listen to after he's finished his, his talk he says you know four people fainted so how do you deal with a person's emotion who you know and I'm sure in some cases Josh you would have made people cry just because maybe the story that you're telling yeah. invokes an emotion in a person and they are a bit teary. Or in Paul's case, yeah. they, they just pass out. What do I do in that situation? Well, the passing out, obviously, there's a first aid issue there. But, Damn. but that's, a, that's another common one. Mm. Um, I, I've seen enough people that train the platform skills and the speaking skills and the, this skills and the that skills. And a, quite a common thing I hear is don't deal with the emotions. Mm. Bypass the emotions, don't deal with them. It's, they have no place in business. They have no place in learning. Reality is we know it's proven in science. We feel emotions. They are real. They have an impact on how our brain processes to make decisions and how we behave and take action. Mm. So if we try to ignore them, they're just going to keep seeping up to the, mm. to the surface. Um, I was speaking with someone the other day who runs a business where he takes care of your elderly parents at home rather than having to go into a nursing home. And he was sharing his business model with a room full of people. And everyone connected with his story. This guy is the most down-to-earth guy. Phil, it, you, you hear him speak and you're captivated by him. 
but the way he conveyed what he would do for your mom or your dad and how he would take care of them just takes people past all mm. this fancy knowledge and thinking to that really means that I connect with that. And he was in a situation where he had about three people at the back of a room started to well up and started to get emotional mm. because they were really relating with the message that he was sharing. And he had someone coaching him saying, you know, you shouldn't acknowledge those emotions. But the reality for him standing at the front of the room is it was infectious. He had a cathartic effect. He started to well up and tear up as well. Mm. And he asked a similar question. He said, what should I have done? Because this guy's saying, shut it out, ignore yeah, it. Yeah. And we know if you shut it out, it's going to come up in some other way. Suppressed anger, we quite often hear comes up in forms of depression. Mm. and it's, it's documented. So I had this conversation with him and I said, well, what would happen if you just paused for a moment? If you just acknowledge that there's a few people that are really relating to what I'm saying right now and you caught that tear in your eye, would people judge you as being weak or would they judge you as being very genuine? Would you earn more respect if you did that? Mm. Yeah, but these business coaches, they were saying, don't deal with the emotion. Don't. Fact is, emotions are real. So if I've been in a session, and I have, where we were talking about finances and we're talking about someone's money mindset and all of a sudden we had someone uh, from Melbourne who was in the group who started to well up and then started to have a very emotional reaction. What it brought up is past experiences, conditioning, some, some issues with her parents. Now, we weren't there to have a counselling or a therapy session, but we recognised what was happening for her and we held enough space and respected that that's what was going on for her. Mm. We allowed her to move through that and everyone else learnt from that process. Mm. And what we did is we maintained that connection, we maintained the certainty and the confidence of the group that we weren't scared of what is real mm. and we were able to move through that. So in the example that you give, yeah, that is going to happen. I'm not a fan of ignoring it. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge it. And in my experience, acknowledging it and not making it wrong, but moving with it, often gains you more respect, more trust, and you can move people further forward. What happens in a case if somebody questions my credibility? So again, uh, maybe if I answer with a story. Uh, I did some work for a mining company. Um, the first gig I had was in the Hunter Valley which is a coal region in New South Wales here in Australia. Um, the guys have got pretty hard conditions that they work in. So uh, the group had a certain mindset. They were sick of people coming in and telling them, you know, suits coming in and telling them how to lead their people. Um, I was there with a colleague. I got up and shared a bit of my experience and, and I copped a spray, as they would say. Someone saying, who the hell are you? Who the hell are you to tell us how to lead a crew of 50 people. Have you ever, have you ever got dirt under your fingernail? Have you ever driven a truck? Really kept hammering me for about mm. 45 minutes. Mm. And if we go back to, to those models, of course, I'm sitting there thinking, what the fudge, what have I got myself into? The emotion that was coming up was fear. I wanted to protect myself. Mm. And then something clicked. I went, uh, the reality kicked in that I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. What right have I got to come here and tell you how to lead your team? Mm. That's not my job. When they were attacking my credibility, all I did is took, took a big picture view, stepped back and said, my role here is the process expert. It's to take you on a journey and draw out your experience on how you lead a team. I'm not going to tell you how to lead a team. It's not my job. That's the old school training, mm. telling you how to do it. And all of a sudden they start sitting back and saying, okay, well, what's this guy about? And then I challenged them back. Mm. And I earned that credibility and respect. So in, in answer to your question, if someone challenges our credibility, we need to be really, really clear on what our role is. Why are we there? And that's part of that W for the, the mm. big picture. If you're there to be the expert, then make sure that you absolutely know what you're doing. But if your expertise is the process or coaching them through mm. to get their own answers, then be clear on that. Don't wear a mask and pretend to be something else. So can you actually train for this? Yeah. Are there areas of specific training that you can do to overcome all these pear-shaped situations? Yeah, uh, I've referenced a few times um, uh, your interview you did with Ben Palmer around emotional intelligence. That's one area. You know, you could, you could get some feedback on your degree of uh, emotional intelligence. We talked about some different profiles like Myers-Briggs or there's DISC or there's others where mm -hmm. you can understand how you work and how you operate as a person. So 
um, there's three or four straight away there. I would start with know yourself first before you even try to help others know themselves. You need to know yourself. Understand your breakpoints. Understand whether it's your personality type or Herman Brain or DISC or whatever profile works for you in your situation. Get some feedback from someone. If it's a formal 360-degree emotional intelligence feedback or if it's a sitting down with a mentor or a friend who's going to be honest with you and reflect who you are, but get to know yourself first. You can then go on and do more formal skills. You could do different forms of training or facilitation skills where you learn how to engage an audience. You could do more academic skills. I'm doing postgraduate work at the moment in, as they say, it's a, um, behavioural analysis and investigative interviewing skills or forensic emotional analysis. So there's different degrees to which we can do this, but the starting point is really get to know yourself first and know where you're at. Do you think it's ever a good idea to remunerate your client for the mistakes that you've made? To pay them back? Really good question. I personally would not. Um, If we cost them by making a serious error and we couldn't, like in that example I gave you, we couldn't show them an improvement, then maybe we wouldn't charge them. Mm. Uh, To pay them back, uh, there's litigious issues that would go with that. Um, If you've done the work and you've done it to your best ability in your integrity... I would say that you should honour what you've done and you should be paid for that. But if you've cost them because you've neglected to do something, then, of course, you, you're going to talk about that. It does raise other issues about who are you being at that time. Should you pay them back? What statement are you making to that person? Mm-hmm. If your job was to facilitate change, was to build their leadership, was to develop their business and you took them through a proven process and it didn't work, then you probably need to sit down and have that learning conversation that we talked mm. about together and say what worked and what didn't. Now, some people sell programs where they have a money-back guarantee. Mm. Generally, those money-back guarantee programs will be going back and sitting down, debriefing that learning yeah. process and saying, what can you own? What did you learn? What did you do? Where did you try and get back on and take that action? So... I think there's a difference too between refunding mm. and paying someone for the mistake. Mm. Paying for the mistake uh, is making a much broader statement and, and making yourself far more open. I think being more transparent mm. about what happened in the process is far more valuable. And, and I'd even challenge it to say you could, if you can't turn that into an opportunity, mm. Robert Cialdani, who um, wrote the books around uh, influence, I heard him once say that uh, a no is not a closed door. Mm. It's an it's open like window to explore more opportunities. Mm. And when I heard that, that really solidified for me that you can always turn something into Mm. a new outcome. So final words, um, people are going to go back in their business tomorrow and touch wood, no mistakes will happen. But invariably or inevitably, a mistake is going to happen. Give me three pieces of um, wisdom that you think I should do should I be in that situation tomorrow morning. So if something goes wrong, I think the the number one takeaway that I'd say is that we all have our own story of change or our story that we tell ourselves about change. We really need to step back and ask ourselves, what is that story? Mm. I was sharing before that under that story we have our reasons why we think change will happen or why it won't, and below that is those emotions. So we really need to look at our own story that we keep telling ourselves and who are we, the self-reflection. Number two, if we make that error happen or that we make it go pear shape. it is our responsibility. Um, use the OMG analogy. Own it, make it a learning experience, and remember you and I were talking about, mm. do that together with someone, mm. not on your own, mm. and then get back on the horse and do it with integrity. Be genuine, take off the mask. If it's out of our control, that's our third one, the WTF. WTF. What's happening? What's the big picture? Why am I here? Take the emotion out of it. The only way you can take the emotion out of it is to acknowledge it, Mm. to experience it and feel it and let it serve a purpose. Mm. And then once we've done the what is it, take the emotion out, focus on an opportunity. Mm. There is always an opportunity. Let those words of Robert Cialdani ring that a no is not a closed door. It's an opening to explore a new opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Joshua Knight, facilitator. Thank you so much. Thank you.